ever thought that brain might work like a radio receiver? This is an idea from David Ball, theoretical physicist that we are going to explore today. Imagine a caveman uh, that traveled to the future and walk him in the jungle. He suddenly finds a device that he wonders what it is. He is trying to play around with the buttons and all of a sudden explores He's wondering why this device is generating that sound. The very first thought would be the device itself is generating the sound. He has no idea this was a radio receiver that would receive the electromagnetic waves through the antenna and would denoise it and produce the sound comprehensible for a human. So the idea of brain as radio comes from this guy, David Bohm, who was a theoretical physicist of the universe, hints at the undivided wholeness of the phenomena. The brain as a radio, tuning into the implicate order. According to Bohm, brain works like a radio. It deciphers signals from the noise of the implicate order to manifest coherent perceptions and thoughts in the explicate order. By drawing parallels between the process of radio signal reception and the brain's interpretation of quantum information, we can explore the idea that consciousness is deeply connected to the fabric of the universe. of a fantastically positive change, but I don't know which way it will go. I really don't. Do you think your theory can bring us towards a question that to me is one of the most interesting questions and I saw that we would never understand is why my consciousness is in my head and your consciousness is in yeah. yours and Peter's <laughs> and his. And you know, why not a hundred years ago and, and maybe why not me, her and her. So why, yeah. why, why am I looking out of this head and yeah. why you're looking out there? <laughs> That's a very interesting question. Why is my consciousness here and your consciousness there? Another way to frame the question is, if my father had, the, had been a different guy, would this right here be a different consciousness? And if you think about it without prejudice, without conceptual narratives telling you that these questions don't make sense or they have trivial answers, you realize how profound the question actually is. My answer is the following. Your consciousness is not in your head. Your head is not a receptacle or a, a kind of cup where you put your consciousness in. Your consciousness is not in your head. It's the other way around. Your head is in your consciousness and my consciousness and his consciousness because we can see you. The head, the body, is what our mental inner life looks like when represented on the screen of perception. It's a symbol for our minds and it correlates with our, our minds because the image of a phenomenon correlates with the thing it is the image of, right? Flames correlate with combustion because they are what combustion looks like. Uh, heads correlate with consciousness, human consciousness, because heads are what human consciousness looks like. So your consciousness is not in your head. Your head is a symbol, a representation of your consciousness, and therefore the question disappears. Your consciousness is not even space-time, because space-time are the dimensions, the paradigm of the representations, not the dimensions or the scaffolding of the world as it is in itself. Mind is not in space-time, only physical things are. So um, that's the way to circumvent the question, is to, to understand that your consciousness is not located. It's like saying the pilot is located in a, in a certain dial on the dashboard. No, 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 the dashboard is a representation of the world where the pilot actually is. The physical world is a dashboard representation. You as a mind is not on the representation, is not in space-time, for the same reason that the, the pilot is not in the dashboard. We are in the world that is represented, and our heads are part of that representation. They are a symbol of our presence in the world as it is in itself. The same forms, with the same shapes, with the same degree of entropy. 
because we would be driven swiftly to extinction if we actually saw the world for what it actually is. And this is a mathematical point that uh, can be proven and has been proven. So, uh, no, we don't see the world as it is. We don't have a transparent windshield to see the world as it is. What we have is a dashboard of dials. And those dials convey accurate and important information about the world, but they aren't the world. And they don't look like the world either. An airplane pilot can fly without, without looking through the window just by looking at the instrument. So the instruments are reliable and important, but they aren't the world. Now, perception is like the dashboard. So what we call colloquially the physical world, the world of things we can touch, smell, uh, feel the texture of, feel the temperature of, uh, taste, uh, see, hear. That's the dashboard. Everything you see, hear, and smell, uh, these are the dials of your dashboard that has been evolved by uh, natural selection. Um, and they convey important information about the world that help you maintain your inner entropy bounded so you don't melt into hot soup and helps you be able to act on that information without being overwhelmed by it, like the little uh, rectangles on your computer desktop that don't overwhelm you like the file, the true version of the file would with the millions of open and closed microscopic switches. So the physical world, what we call colloquially the physical world is but a dashboard. And what is behind the dashboard, the thing that is measured for the measurements to then be presented in the dials of the dashboard, that's the world as it actually is. That's the real world. And the question we want to ask is, what is that real world? If physicality is the dashboard, then that world is by definition not physical because it's that which stands behind the dashboard. What is it then? So just to reinforce it, we don't have a transparent uh, windscreen. We only have the dashboard and instrumentation doesn't change this dashboard paradigm because even if you have a telescope, you still have to perceive the output of the uh, telescope. You still have to perceive the output of instrumentation. So all of that gets filtered through the dials of the dashboard. And at the end of the day, all you have is still the dials of the dashboard. You've never had a peak uh, through a transparent window to see the world as it actually is. And we are now at a point where we can say this is as near to a established fact as we can get. Now, physics, it turns out, is pointing in the same direction. There has been a flurry of very important papers over the last 40 years, particularly over the last 20, um, that show that physical entities do not have standalone existence. And by the way, this series of experiments have received the, the Nobel Prize uh, in physics this year. The three uh, laureates uh, were the people who have developed and, and evolved and improved these experiments and carried them out for the past 40 years. To think of reality in a different way, whether you believe it or not, but even to give the hypothesis a serious chance, we have to change a certain perspective. We have to regard the world through a, or from a slightly different perspective in order to give the hypothesis a fair hearing. Is nature material? Is nature spiritual? Whatever that means. Is nature thought? Is nature ideal? All we have is perception. First of all, we could deny the existence of consciousness altogether. So we just have matter. I suppose symmetrically, we could deny the existence of matter and say that all there is is consciousness. Our everyday perceptions are of objects in space and time. We see trees and deer and foliage, light and shade. We see a three-dimensional world of, of shapes and objects. And for most of us, we, we take that world as objective, that we assume that what we're seeing is pretty close to what's really there. We do know that, that some of these objects seem to have consciousness. So when we look at our face in the mirror, we know firsthand that what we see in the mirror, which is just skin, hair, and eyes, is hiding something very, very important. It's our conscious experiences, our love of chocolate, our love of poetry, or whatever, whatever we might like, our fears, our hopes, our desires our friendships, all the things that are important to us that we're conscious of are hidden behind a face. The face gives us a little portal 
into the consciousness of the person that we're looking at. Near-death experiences, spontaneous mystical experiences, including ones that occur in childhood, and other kinds of altered states of consciousness, which suggest that their consciousness is part of something greater than themselves. In the 17th century, the scientific revolution was a revolution precisely because it denied these traditional views. For the founders of modern science, nature was not a living organism, it was a machine. Animals and plants were not living organisms, they were machines, automata, unconscious, inanimate automata. The human body was a machine. And in the vision of René Descartes, who's founded this mechanistic philosophy most explicitly, the whole universe is made of inanimate matter, which works mechanically by pushing and by being pushed from the past through physical, mechanical causes. The stars and the planets are mechanical objects made of unconscious matter. The materialist said there's no such thing as this realm of immaterial spirit. It doesn't do anything. You can't measure it. You can't weigh it. You can't see it. Therefore, it doesn't exist. God and angels don't exist. They're just figments of the imagination. So at one stroke, God and angels disappear from this mechanical universe. And that's all that's left is human consciousness. What's remarkable is that brilliant scientists have been working on this problem for decades. And there is, to date, not a single specific conscious experience that can be explained. Not one. That's a remarkable failure. We're used to the idea that the mind is the inside, the body is the outside, there's the external world, the inner world. We use these metaphors all the time. They're spatial metaphors. My inner life, the inner world inner consciousness and indeed from a materialist point of view the brain literally is inner your thoughts are supposed to be nothing but the activity of your brain and i should stress that what goes on in unconsciousness is not in any way inferior to what goes on in consciousness i make discriminations i reason i make judgments i find things beautiful solve problems take decisions weigh possible outcomes imagine possibilities exercise acquired skills fall in love and struggle to balance competing desires and moral values all the time without being reflexively aware of it. And note that these are not just calculations, but rely on my whole embodied being, my experience, my history, my memory, my feelings, my thoughts, my personality, even dare I say it, my soul, psyche in the broadest sense. And what is interesting is that a number of philosophers have suggested that there's something wrong when we're conscious of things. That things work best when we're not conscious of them and consciousness is like a sort of emergency rescue team which is brought in when we, co we confront a problem. We have to start from the world we see and we have to ask ourselves, suppose you're in an airplane and you look through the window and you see a storm outside and a vast sky with lightning and the sun setting and whatnot. Is the world that is truly out there exactly the same as the world as we see it. An airplane pilot can fly without looking through the window just by looking at the instrument. So the instruments are reliable and important, but they aren't the world. Now, perception is like the dashboard, the physical world, the world of things we can touch, smell, feel the texture of, feel the temperature of, taste, see, hear. That's the dashboard. Everything you see, hear, and smell, these are the dials of your dashboard and helps you be able to act on that information without being overwhelmed by it. If physicality is the dashboard, then that world is by definition not physical because it's that which stands behind the dashboard. What is it then? Consciousness, like gravity, mass, and charge, may be one of the irreducible properties of the universe for which no further account is possible. We must entertain the radical possibility that some rudimentary form of consciousness must be added to the list of things such as mass or electric charge that the world is built on. So there's not really a lot going for the idea that we can dismiss consciousness. So could we dismiss matter? I would say that matter appears to me an element within consciousness that provides the necessary resistance for creation and with it inevitably for individuality to arise. All individual beings, including ourselves, bring forms into being and cause them to persist. I think this debate is most interesting when you carry on. Flocks of animals or social groups 
ecosystems, the whole planet. We already have a holistic view of Gaia, the planet, in the Gaia hypothesis, which is telling us that the entire planet is a living organism. And then if we carry on to the solar system, and particularly to the sun, I'm particularly interested in this question of, is the sun conscious? And as soon as you raise that question, you realize that you're breaking a taboo. As a modern educated person, you're not meant to ask that question. It's, it, you're meant to sneer if somebody says, is the sun conscious? You're meant to dismiss it as absurd or ridiculous or childish. And the reason it's so easily dismissed as childish and ridiculous is that practically all humans, except us, have taken it for granted. So the idea is we're better than them because we're smarter, more educated and more scientific and they're all wallowing in ridiculous superstitions. Also, children think the sun's conscious. Uh, that's why they draw it with a smiley face. Again, proof that it's a childish superstition. In, in most cultures, people think the sun is conscious and usually think of it as a god or a goddess. And there's a revival of spiritual practices today. These spiritual practices are ways in which we can actually get into a closer direct experience with these forms of consciousness beyond the human level. It's how I think of it myself. And I spent years as a card-carrying materialist and atheist, so I'm very familiar with that worldview. But if you want to stick to a materialist worldview and dismiss all these experiences as make-believe, then what you have to do is dismiss your own experience of consciousness. Mind is not necessarily what is in here, it may also be what is out there. It may still be mental out there, although not in your personal mind. Just like the thoughts of another person are out there from your perspective, but not in your personal mind. And the whole world, the whole universe, the entirety of existence may be mental stuff. We are not just observers of the world that have to respond to it in a in a moral and, and, and decent way that maximizes our happiness, but we actually have the considerable honor and burden of helping shape what is. One could say that through the human being, the universe has created a mirror to observe itself. In other words, consciousness is not to our purposes. We are to the purposes of consciousness. This seems to me the essence of creation. Differentiation of something that's not thereby destroyed in its unity, but enriched as with the unfolding of something hitherto implicit into a new, more explicit order, like the unfolding of a of a bud into the flower, which is still that plant's bud or flower, but it's now enriched, but it's still a whole, despite the parts.